right, everyone. We're going to get started once again here. Finish up with the last panel of the evening. Uh, if you guys have refilled your beverages, maybe you could find your way back to your seats. And we're going to get the discussion rolling. Check. We've got a fine group of individuals up here with me. Going to be talking about the Florida market a little bit. Um, Florida's a, a pretty emerging scene. It's emerging so much that people can't stop talking about it. Um, I have to find creative ways to get people in their seats. Justin, you know this. It, wor it yeah? worked. Um, no, th thank you guys for coming out. Uh, I promise you that we'll have, uh, you know, another uh, 45 minutes or so to network after this, um, or as long as Cigar City will have you, I suppose. Um, but uh, in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about the Florida market. I've got three folks up here who know it very, very well. Chris LaRue from ABC Fine Wines and Spirits, all the way down there. In the middle, Justin Clark, Vice President, Cigar City, and... Kent Bailey from Coppertail Brewing. Big round of applause from these guys. So one of the goals uh, when we travel around the country is really to learn a little bit more about the environment that we're in, um, understand you know, some of the trends, be it style trends, uh, retail trends, consumer behavior. Um, just really try to get a better understanding of what uh, makes a market tick. And, um, you know, I guess the goal of this uh, discussion is really to, dis to uh, dive kind of headfirst into um, some, some data that I was able to grab from Nielsen um, and discuss some trends that are happening here so, uh, and, and talk a little bit about what makes Florida's beer market unique and, you know, kind of what the opportunity is here for craft. Um, so I think, Justin, uh, when we spoke last week, you had mentioned that, you know, it's a number three beer state, um, but the data that I got shows that only 10% market share by dollars for craft, um, latest 52 weeks through January 30th. So um, still plenty of run room. Uh, I guess what's the most unique characteristic about Florida's beer market? And uh, I'll start with you, Justin, and then you guys can all uh, take a shot at it. Um, we'll appreciate it because uh, we can't afford that data, so my numbers are just <laughs> as close as I can get them. So, uh, no, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I, I think Florida's pretty unique. Uh, we're a state that everybody wants to sell beer here. Uh, you'll see a lot of national players even jumping states to come to Florida. There's a lot of our Florida brewery brethren in here. We're lucky we get to start here, but it's obviously pretty competitive here as well. Um, so we're unique in the fact that we're the third largest in population, so there's a lot of people to sell beer to. Um, but, and we also have, I mean, our whole economy is based on tourism, so we have a bunch of visitors um, so you got a lot of people, an influx of people coming to visit our state, and hopefully we can get them to try some local beer while they're here. Chris, how about from your perspective? I mean, you're engaging uh, with these consumers on a daily basis. Uh, I'm sure you get to see a lot of the trends just in your own stores. Um, what makes Florida's beer scene unique? Um, I'd say that uh, there's no early adopters on any, in any category for anything in Florida. Um, we, we, I mean, we're always behind for everything. Um, but when we want to catch up, we catch up fast. So, and I think that's what you're seeing now is, is, is you're seeing people gravitate towards local, gravitate towards authentic, and that's, and that's in everything. Um, and you're looking at it intense flavors, just like food, um, just like where the wine market's going. Everything's about th those three things, being authentic, um, being local, and, and being just intense. Um, and that's... Uh, where we're going everybody we're catching up fast because people want the experience they don't want to drink the same thing they've always drunk because once they try a real beer you know something that that they actually enjoy you know their eyes open and go wow this is beer so right. and, and obviously one of those uh, newer breweries is Coppertail Kent you're sort of on the ground floor of this thing um, you know probably a, a totally different perspective than someone like Justin might have from Cigar City because you're a little smaller so what are you seeing out there I think almost everything that Justin says is wrong most of the time. <laughs> so I think that's why they included me on here. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think um, what I'm seeing that's really surprising me is like for the past five years, just the rate of change um, in the growth. So like five years ago, if I rewind my brain to like planning a brewery, trying to open a brewery, the number of breweries that have opened in the last few years is just amazing. And I think that's having big impacts uh, on the market. 
Hopefully, a lot of those impacts will be good as we get lots of new people making innovative stuff. Um, but it certainly presents challenges as well. Yeah. And, and Chris, uh, you talked a little bit about the challenges that brewers are going to face uh, when we spoke last week. And, and um, you know, I think you had sort of pointed to the, the lack of availability in shelf space um, for all of the new brands that are you know, effectively trying to take the same approach, which is, you know, penetrate the, uh, the liquor chains, um, and you're going to have to make some tough choices. So uh, talk to me a little bit about kind of the availability, you know, what's out there for, for a store like yours and how you decide between all the brands now. Uh, so we're already out of space and we've been out of space. So if we're out of space, everyone is out of space. So what I would tell you is keep us top of mind. You know, the FaceTime is very important, be relevant. Don't be an imitator. You know, just because IPAs are selling doesn't mean you need to have another IPA be your own person. Um, I look at it like cider was, or like session IPAs. Cider didn't become a huge category. Angry Orchard became a huge category. Session IPAs didn't become a huge category. It was all day IPA becoming. So you create something and assume it's gonna sell because there's a market for it. There's not always a market for those things. What we wanna hear is your story. We want you to own your tap room, we want you to own your zip code, own your area, and then grow. We will gladly give you as much space as you need to grow in your areas first. If you have three stores in your zip code, or in your area code, we're gonna put all your beers in there. You may not get full distribution in all our stores, we're gonna try to grow it the right way for you because the, 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 the beer industry, the, the way to sell beer is flipped on its head. It used to be you can get distribution, that's all it was about, get distribution everywhere and you're good. Distribution means nothing now, absolutely nothing. It's all about, it's all about getting that beer, that liquid into people's mouths and, and getting the repeat business. Yeah, it definitely seems like rate of sale and velocity are the, are the two biggest things, or the biggest thing rather, um, you know, in, in determining uh, what makes a brand uh, viable for, for the long term. I, I, one other thing real quick, we're a little different because we do store specific sets based on store specific sales, so we don't have groups of stores where we just we, we, we group a bunch of products in and say this these stores can sell this because we don't think that's the right way to go. We think every store is unique, especially with local breweries. It's very I mean it's 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 very evident that you know a brewery over here may not sell over here because they own this market and they're there. So that's one thing that's one reason why you can be successful with us versus maybe not every you know every chain around the state. Justin, um, Kent pointed to uh, all the new breweries that have started up uh, locally here in, in Tampa specifically. I think um, we were out last night and we heard 46 breweries. Um, I, know it's, I know it's more than 40 in the sort of greater Tampa area. Um, and in Florida in general, I mean, it's you know, more than 150 breweries. Uh, and, and certainly a lot of that has come online uh, since Cigar City opened. Um, how has that changed the way you guys approach the market with some of your brands? Um, I don't know that anything specifically changed just because there's more people opening. We're continuing to stay on our path. I would say that we've probably trained and, and used to employ a lot of those people. And we actually celebrate that fact, to be honest, because, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we believe we're making great beer. And if somebody has a passion to go open their own place and they got to brew here commercially in Florida instead of going out of our state uh, to go follow their passion, we want to celebrate the fact that they're making badass beer here in Florida. And it's pretty cool to us that they used to work here and, and maybe we taught them something, but then they've got their own ideals and, and maybe they're going to return around and teach us something. So, uh, you know, we, we're celebrating all these breweries that are opening um, as long as they're making quality beer. Because the scariest thing to us is somebody making bad beer. Um, that's what's going to hurt us in a, in a market like Florida where we are so far under indexed to the rest of the country. Uh, you know, the numbers that you said earlier were a 10 share in dollars. In actual cases, we're, we under index. They're what we're like a six share, I believe. Um, so there's a lot of room for growth, and we're educating a lot of people because we've been so far behind as a state. So we all need to work together to educate people about great beer, and then we're all going to get to sell a lot, of a lot of beer. But if people start making bad beer, it's gonna, that's going to bring the category down for all of us, and that's when it, it's going to get scary. Well, I mean, I think uh, last night uh, we ducked into a 7-Eleven to grab uh, some waters before the end of the night. And uh, lo and behold, you know, there was some copper tail six packs in there. Um, so, you know, clearly uh, it's the story or the beer or something about the brand is resonating to the point where it's, it's in a 7-Eleven chain. Um, 
so I, I guess what are you doing to, to stand out from so, so many of the other uh, breweries right now, Kent? Wow. That's rough with an audience full of, uh, of other breweries. So, uh, <laughs> Putting you on the spot. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not sure that we're doing much like to really uh, try to differentiate ourselves from our peer group of breweries. Uh, I think it comes back to what Justin said, which is focusing really heavily on quality, trying to make the products that we want to make. Uh, we try to be really uncompromising in that. It's either uh, free dive is our number one seller, so it's either free dive or, or it's not. And if it's not, we don't want to sell it. And so we hope that our customers appreciate that. Um, and yeah, and we've been fortunate to start getting some uh, retail distribution on the bottles. Yeah. Well, it was, it was free dive, in fact, uh, that we okay. saw. So cool. you're doing something right. Um, but I, I guess long term, I mean, if, if everybody's sort of taking the same approach, I mean, it would seem like, uh, you know, everybody's got the same basic idea of how they approach the retail market. You know, get some, get some distribution, get some placement in ABC and kind of work your way out. Um, it's just going to be incredibly difficult to cut through. So, Chris, I mean, what can people do to stand out um, and, and remain in your stores, remain a, a viable player in your stores? I think you said Cigar City was, uh, in some, some accounts, your number one seller. So I think the first thing is understanding each channel and know not that every channel is going to be right for your brand. Um, eventually, you can grow into every channel, but for new brands, it's going to be places where people are looking for discovery like us. You know, it's not going to be grocery unless, you know, you're going to BOGO or something like that, which obviously most of you Don't ever are. do that, yeah, please. Don't. So, so, and then eventually you're going to graduate to C-Store. Um, but it's, it's understanding us, understanding we, we want to be there to help people discover. We want to carry every one of the SKUs if your brand resonates with the consumer. We want a Publix to carry two or three SKUs. We want to carry the whole line so people can get introduced at Publix, but then if they want that double IPA or that rare beer, they can come to ABC for us. So, so when you're looking at it at a market specific, we want you in retail. We want you exciting our beer consultants. We're, we're the only retailer in the state that has certified, you know, certified uh, beer consultants uh, that are certified, Cicerone level one certified. So we want you using those people to sell your beer. We want them, we want those people to be your feet on the ground. We want them to really talk and understand your story and what, why somebody should buy your beer versus somebody else. So really just getting into our stores, educating us you know, in the office and then also educating our store employees and using our resources. We've got a fantastic marketing team. You know, if you're looking to send email blasts when you have a new item out or, or whatever it is, pairings, give us some content. Every retailer's content starved. Every one of us. Give us some content to use and we can use it. Interesting. Justin, it looks like you're chomping at the bit here. Well, he's kind of mentioned it. Chris has kind of mentioned it twice. At the end of the day, the beer business is still a relationship business. We can look at a lot of data and a lot of fancy things. But in two different questions, he's basically answered and said it comes down to relationships. He's saying to get in front of them. It's so important to get in front of the retailers, get in front of the wholesalers. We're all fighting to be top of mind in a three-tier system. So, of course, you're top of mind in your own tap room. But it's being top of mind at your wholesaler and being top of mind in front of the retailers. So it's based on those relationships. And if you're making a quality beer, the rest usually falls into place. Right. How do, you, how do you maintain a relationship with someone like Chris and then also with, you know, a totally different buyer at, at say, a Publix that's taking a totally different approach? We were waiting for that question. I can't be totally honest because Chris is sitting here. No. <laughs> Um, he texts me at night. <laughs> to be completely candid, it, it, they're two different stores. You're selling to two different people. He has flexibility to put us into three stores. That doesn't usually happen at a large chain grocery store. They want to know that you're going to have that six pack or even that 22 or even that 12 pack and it's going to be in stock every single time they order it. When we can have a quick conversation with Chris and say, we only have 20 cases going to your market. Can you make this work with 130 stores and we work together to find those the stores that it makes the most sense the stores that are moving that volume but it's coming down to the relationship that we have and we also have a great relationship you know with those large grocery stores Publix and ABC we all talk about supporting local and being local those are both local chains so we're pretty lucky in Florida to have Publix here who's the biggest buyer of beer in the state and ha having a great independent chain like ABC and if you can win at his location, the other retailers start to take notice. Right. We, we want you to use us. 
Use us to grow your brands. That's why we're here. Dedicate your resources to us because eventually you're going to get into Publix. You're going to get into Walmart. You're going to get into those true volume locations that you can churn beer out of. We may not be your volume location, but we know who we are, and we want you to, to, to dedicate your resources to us. Right. Kent, have you started dedicating resources to, to ABC yet? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I hope that we've dedicated enough resources to ABC. Uh, we certainly... Um, we love the role that ABC plays in Florida, and I think everybody in this room probably shops there, and, and uh, that's where you go to find your interesting beers, right? The, the really strange things that you're not going to see elsewhere. Then, you know, when you're in there getting your groceries at Publix, then you pick up your six-pack of High Lie. So, um, so that, as for resources, though, that brings up a great point, and it's kind of growing pains that we're going through right now. I mean, we started with one... Um, salesperson uh, on the ground here in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, then as our footprint grew a little, um, he was traveling more, and then we hired another salesperson or two, and, and then, but the, the, that question is just, you know, what's the right balance? How many people do you need to have in the market, um, you know, establishing those relationships and talking to people and making sure everything is going well? And it's hard to know. Well, and especially when so many outside players are, you know, heavily investing in this marketplace, be it, you know, a Sam Adams or a CBA or anyone else. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of brands that are skipping states to come into Florida and they're putting boots on the ground. Uh, they're investing, you know, real dollars behind their brands. Um, I mean, it, it seems like it's got to make it really, really challenging for some of the local players. Yeah, I would say right now, if you want to sell beer outside of your own tap room, um, you're probably going to need somebody that is working with that wholesaler and splitting time working with the retailers to build those relationships. You can be super successful and make a good living making it all and selling it yourself. But we're competing with big breweries, as you mentioned, coming into our state that are coming from states where they're allowed to have limited self-distribution. So they're more profitable in what they're selling at home and bringing those resources to come compete against us here locally. And uh, we don't have those resources. We're fortunate that we do have our tap rooms and it's great to have retailers that are e even realize that we're all building a base to our pyramids at our tap rooms. If we're not strong in our backyard, we're not gonna make it beyond that. But to be relevant at a wholesaler who's got more SKUs than they ever thought there would be, and then going to a retailer who's already out of shelf space, you've got to have people there making sure nobody forgets about your brewery. And we're fairly large in the state of Florida, still small um, in the grand scheme of craft beer. But uh, we, we could probably use a couple more people. But the crazy part about that is we're still selling all the beer we can make. So what's that balance of investing in just a person if the beer's already sold? So it's, it's a really hard thing for an owner of a brewery to decide what's important. Uh, I think at Cigar City, you know, Joey has believed we're always staffing to where we want to go next. So we're working on those relationships now because we want to make some more beer, as you heard in the earlier talk. And uh, with so many people out there, we want to make sure we're relevant. Right. Well, and it seems like some of it would be uh, defensive as much as it is offensive as well. I mean, you know, you got to kind of protect your home turf, right? Yeah, I would, I would say so. I, you, the breweries that are just there to make great beer, if they can live off their tap room, great. If they can't, they're going to need to invest in people. I mean, it, there's no way around it. It's, you, you, you've got to get people out there. With, with so much open run, run room here in, in Florida um, and you know, plenty of local players, I mean, who's going to capture that share? Let's assume that uh, you know, things keep growing and you know, I guess the, the Brewers Association goal is 20% you know, market share by 2020. Um, if we apply that philosophy just to the Florida market, you know, we've got, you know, 10% more market share by dollars to grab. So who's, who's going to capture that? Is that going to be the local brands or is it going to be the guys that are skipping states to come to Florida because they see opportunity? I see it being all local. I see the guys skipping states. Uh, although they do a lot of great things, it's, it's, it's hard for them to tell that story that's going to resonate with retail. It's going to end up in price, and nobody wants to be there in price when you're selling six ninety nine dollars craft six-packs. So that's, that's what we see. Do you agree, Justin? I agree to a point with Chris, but I see a, a tiny bit different. Um, there's going to be some of these big breweries that are skipping states and coming here that are definitely going to be successful because they have some of those more resources. 
So all of us locally got to work together to, uh, to get that shelf space and keep it local. But there's totally going to be some relevant out-of-state people, but there's going to be some out-of-state people that haven't been cutting edge and just realize, oh, wow, we've invested in our brewery in X state, and now we can't sell it all at home, so let's just get some to Florida. I know we can high spot a little bit. I think that's going to be a lot tougher on breweries to just come and high spot and quote-unquote dump beer in Florida like we used to be able to do. All of us that have been beer geeks for a while were stoked when that happened because we could get some really good beer that was never available here. But if there's nobody representing it, nobody talking about it, you bought it when it first came, and if it's dying on the shelf, none of us are buying it. We're going back and grabbing a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale because you know it's going to be consistent anytime you see it. Right. I'll just jump in on that one, too. Um, I agree. There's always going to be some of the bigger regional players that are going to stay relevant. They're going to keep the excitement level high, and people are going to want to buy them in Florida. What we're seeing is uh, as we're gaining... Um, a little bit of traction in different areas, we're hearing from accounts, oh, we just took off that big local brand to put you on. We just took that big local brand off the shelf to make room for you. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did I say local? I meant big, uh, big regional. So those big, those big regional brands, I think, are, are feeling that pinch. And I really didn't realize that until I was at, a, at an event maybe kind of like this um, a month or two ago. And somebody from one of those bigger regional brands, after I introduced myself, he's like, oh, you're one of those breweries down there in Tampa that's screwing up my sales. And I was like, <laughs> you know, so I think some of the regional You're like, guys, you're welcome? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I don't think we can take credit for that, you know, single-handedly, but I think Tampa as an area, all these breweries are coming together and just kind of crowding out the people outside the market. Maybe not totally, but just putting some more pressure there. Right. We, so we see that in our sales, that all the... All the very good regional breweries are getting squeezed, and I'm talking the the people that make the top quality liquids. Everybody's getting squeezed at retail. So, so while you are taking people from other beverage alcohol segments and from domestic premium and imports, you are taking a lot of people from existing craft. So those guys have to figure out how to continue to grow in Florida, um, and they're gonna, they're they're having to start to really innovate. And it's it hopefully it'll be good for everybody. Right. How much of this, Chris, do you think is sort of brand product life cycle for, for some of these guys? And, um, you know, how much of it is like the, the actual push behind the, the localness of a beer? So uh, we look at it two different ways. We look at the, the exciting stuff, the one-offs. They actually keep you relevant, keep people excited. That 1% beer geek used to just be a, a weirdo, hipster, bearded dude. Now he's the guy on social media that everybody's following because they want to know what he's drinking because he's <laughs> on the cutting edge. So we see the, that the beer geek actually bringing people back to the mainstream. So when we look at the product life cycles, it's kind of the same way. We don't, we see the, the, the in and outs, the one-offs, bringing people back to, to the basics, which is good. And that used to not be that way. It used to be two separate things. So, so we don't really see it as, as the brands having product life cycles when it's local. It's more staying innovative and staying, um, staying relevant. Got it. So uh, from, a, from a local perspective, Kent and uh, Justin, are you guys in Tampa and I guess more broadly Florida doing enough as sort of a unified group of Florida brewers or Tampa brewers to really push behind the local message? Or is that something that um, you guys could, could work harder on? Because, I mean, we get to a lot of markets and we see that, you know, in places like, I don't know, San Diego or Portland, Oregon, I mean, there, you know, there is a strong um, uh, desire to support local brands. So is that something you guys are working on here? Um, yeah, I think... I, I think we're all doing our best to push that cause forward by trying to create um, awesome local brands that produce the, um, national quality beer. Um, and that should convince people that they don't have to go outside Tampa Bay or Florida to find a really high quality beer here. Um, they're all around you. They're all around you in this room, too. So, but um, what was the question? I guess. <laughs> I, I guess I just could, start talking sometimes. Well, I, I guess um, are you guys doing enough uh, from sort of a single unified voice oh. to kind of push that message a little bit more strongly? Yeah, we've got our Florida Brewers Guild, which um, we have a really high membership 
uh, percentage in the state of Florida. And so we're hoping the Brewers Guild can do more in the coming years to help push Florida beer, um, local beer in whatever city you're in in Florida. Um, also, I've heard rumors that there are um, local chapters starting up of um, you know, city or metro-wide brewery groups. And I think that's a great idea. Like um, I believe Joey said earlier, we all get along pretty well. So if we work together, I think we can all sell more beer. Yeah, I mean, we're often in each other's tap rooms because we're all doing different kinds of beers and going to check out, you know, it's not checking out the competition. It's like, they're doing something awesome that we don't make. I'm, I'm going to go check out their beer. And I think that is bringing us loosely together where we all have the relationship where we're talking about each other's brands. I mean, we have other breweries beers on our guest taps here. We're excited to help, you know, push the local market and have that on tap. But I think like any business that's rapidly growing, we're growing. I think a new brewery just opened in Tampa while we were talking. <laughs> so to that point, we could always get better at working together collectively. Right. And maybe it's, a, as Kent alluded to, you know, forming some local guilds that work in tandem with the state guilds. Um, because we're still a pretty young industry as a whole in Florida. I yeah. mean, we're the old people at, you know, under seven years. So there's a lot of... A lot of those states that you referenced have been added a lot longer, so they have a lot more infrastructure built to work together to push that. We're doing it still pretty loosely, right. but all because we're passionate about what everybody's doing. So one of, one of the things that we always used to hear, and I think it was um, you know, more from a national perspective, was like, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. I don't know that that's necessarily true anymore everywhere. I don't know that that's the case everywhere. I mean, it seems like there's so much competition that that just couldn't possibly be accurate. But um, maybe in Florida, kind of what I'm hearing is that that still might be the case. I personally still feel that's the case here locally. We're only at a 10 share in dollars. We got a lot of room to grow where we can band together um, and encourage nobody to discount. Let's all sell our beer at full margin and uh, work together to get shelf space. And uh, we've got a lot of room to grow here. Sometime, though, it might not be that rosy where it isn't the rising tide floats all boats. Um, but I personally feel we've got, a, we've got we're, we're so under indexed in Florida based on our population and everything. We can work together for quite a few more years. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'd say the rising tide gets trial. But if you make shit beer, you're going to have shit sample. I mean, you're going to have shit sales. So, so you are going to get the trial. But... Just make damn good beer and sell it in the right locations. When I start seeing it in these random locations where I know that the... I was in New Orleans Airport. I was at this weird little little pub in there, and they had this the stankiest local IPA I've ever had. Because I know it's probably been sitting there for God knows how long. Either that or it's just bad beer. So, so just make good beer. Yeah, it's not always the brewer's fault. I think that is the biggest risk to the, to the rising tide theory, though. It's a, uh, a good point that, yeah, as that tide rises, we want everybody to feel like that is, it's a great tide. It's a delicious tide. We all want to be on this tide. We don't want it to be, yeah, half of this tide is kind of nasty. I don't think I'm going to drink craft beer. So um, if we screw it up, the tide's going to lower all of us, too. Right. Don't want low tide. Or red tide. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Let's switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit about style trends. Um, you know, I guess you know, we, we go to so many different places. We see so many different, um, you know, unique sort of styles to that area. Justin, you and I were talking about it today, you know, in, in the Boston area where we're based, um, that, that New England style IPA. And your, your, uh, your snide remark was that we're all blind up there because we, uh, we can't see how clear the beer is or something like that. I thought like that, that was private. I'm a fan of what they're doing over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, You're creating a new style. Yeah. Well, I guess down here, it would be the, the floor device is what you guys call it. So um, talk to me about some style trends, including the floor device, and, and what else you guys are seeing out there. Um, well, first off, we talked about this in our pre-meeting. You can make all the seasonals you want, but please, there was don't, a pre -meeting? please don't call it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> please don't call it summer, winter, fall, or spring, because you guys know we don't have damn seasons here. So... Make all the seasonals you want, but please, I mean, people come to us and go, why isn't our winter beer selling? Why isn't summer beer selling? Well, fuck, summer's like 12 months here. Nobody, it's not going to sell. Don't call it summer. All right. <laughs> call it your seasonal wheat beer, man. So anyway, I just had to throw that out there. Um, call it so, it sells. Right, they'll, they'll, talk about, they'll talk about styles. <laughs> 
All right. <clears throat> Are we I ready for beers we're, yet? Uh, networking. We're, uh, we're, yeah, we're in Florida. I think it ne just naturally makes sense. Um, looking for styles that are a little lower alcohol, easier drinking yep. lately, um, have, been, have been doing really well. Sour beers, gozas, and um, Berliner Weisses with fruit. And in Florida, we have access to so many awesome fruits, and we can get so many of them fresh that um, I think we really can make better fruited Berliner Weisses in Florida than you can get in other states. So I think that's an awesome advantage to just keep um, using. And, and I, that certainly gives um, the geographic region, I mean, something to be known for and something to sort of rally around. Um, and I think every sort of area of the country is kind of looking for something like that. You know, the West Coast style IPA or, you know, whatever the style trend is, I think you're always looking to attach sort of a, a geography to a particular style. Um, how viable is that, do you think, with a tart, sour, Berliner Weiss fruit offering um, here in Florida? I think people are always going to be looking for those because of our climate. Um, but is that going to be your 55% of production? I don't think we're there yet. What is kind of cool, as Kent referenced, we grow a lot of tropical fruit here. That is our local ingredient because we're not growing malt here, though we are working with the University of Florida on some Florida-grown hops. Small plug for any brewers that want to donate to hop research, get with me. I'll uh, let you know about that. But we are trying to grow some hops in Florida. But we do have access to lots of great local fruit. Um, but being a tart kind of style, that is still going to be a small percentage of overall sales. I think it's one a lot of us in this room get excited about. But then you see a large national um, brewery in Sierra Nevada doing a Goza style beer this year for national consumption. We talked earlier about these bigger breweries coming to our state. Sometimes they bring a lot of positive stuff because they have a lot of resources and they can help us educate a lot more consumers at once than we can. So the fact that they're making a, a big play into the Goza category is great for all of us that are doing those kinds of beers. But it, it is pretty cool that Florida is, you know, we've called it the Florida vice. I think there's still some debate, maybe even internally in this room, if if it's a fruited Berliner or a Florida Weiss, I think it's kind of cool that we can brand our state as a whole. Uh, so when tourists are coming down, they're like, oh, I got to try that style that this right. place is made for. Ho hopefully it has, uh, I guess, more legs or um, a, a better marketability than like, you know, Cascadian dark ales or black IPAs. I mean, that whole debate just didn't really seem to go anywhere. It might come back. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to make it work. Right. Um, how about how about loggers? You got one in your hand there, Justin. You guys just started making one. Uh, well, you made a Hellas, but you sort of rebranded, retooled the recipe. Uh, obviously, putting a bigger push behind it. Um, where do you see that going, Pilsners, loggers? We're seeing that trend all over the country now. I think it's another way to attack, uh, not attack, because that sounds negative. Another way to join in the sessionability category. We, you know, our number one seller is a seven and a half percent IPA. We scratch our heads all the time at the amount of seven and a half IPA that these people will drink in a sitting. All of us, you know, working at the brewery, got to get home responsibly, and uh, and so we want a beer that we can all enjoy and drink quite a few of. The problem was that the, you know we we. We made it a point to have a balanced portfolio. Uh, why we still do a bunch of crazy one-offs and all that, we still wanted a balanced portfolio of our cores. But a lager takes longer to make, and you can't sell it necessarily for more. So when you're looking at your tanks are full 24-7, it's tough to give tank space to a lager. So we had to make a conscious decision um, that that's a category we wanted to go in because it was something we were all passionate about. And um, we were confusing a lot of people with our Hotter Than Hellas pun. And so we decided it was time to uh, clean that branding up. And we did change the beer a little bit. It's uh, only 4.5% alcohol now, um, and it's dried out a little bit. So it's not the exact same beer, um, but it's something that we're all stoked on. And it is, um, it's exceeding expectations at retail. Um, we've been out of stock on it until today from our tasting room for, for two weeks. And uh, it's far exceeded what we guessed that the state of Florida would need. So we're basically out of stock on it for the next month and a half, and we're working with our partners at the Brew Hub to, uh, to be able to make more of it because people are looking for, for more sessionable styles. And sessionable, sessionable any style is kind of the holy grail for, for uh, on-premise and off because we'd love for people to, to be able to consume more responsibly, just like on-premise would. So we, we will do anything we can to promote those styles because instead of selling one six-pack, we're going to sell two. Right. 
Well, and it seems like Kraft, uh, you know, really needed to get back to some form of sessionability at some point in order to drive volume. I mean, at the end of the day, it's kind of what it comes down to, right? Yeah, we're releasing our double session ale um, next week. <laughs> <laughs> and, on, and on the lagers, I think it's interesting. Um, Cigar City um, has, has retooled their lager and is, it's doing really well. And kind of all independently of one another, I've noticed many of the breweries in Florida that I've spoken to, we, we're all about to release a lager, oddly enough. A lot of us are. I think Big Storm has a lager. That's, Pilsner, right? Uh, Pilsner. And then we've got a Pilsner coming out this summer. Um, so, and I, I've heard from a few other breweries. So I think there's a lot of people giving it a shot this year and just seeing if that ends up being a big um, craft style for us. Uh, uh, on the flip side of that, you have to be pretty mature to be able to sell a sessionable beer. It's, it's, the customer has to really trust you to pay the same price for lower ABV, at least in Florida right now, because we don't have a very mature customer yet, or right. mature customer base. So they're going to look at that ABV. They always do. We see it all the time. So you're going to have to have a very, a very good customer base to be able to sell those off premise. Do, do you expect to see more uh, local breweries introducing loggers? Are they coming into your store already kind of selling that in? They already are. Um, we'd like, like them to sell through, too. You know, Anything can come through the back door. We just need to see, see them sell through the register. We've seen a lot of people try in the past. Um, now, this is a new age, but we've seen a lot of people try You know, a couple of years ago where people were not buying low ABV beer from, from local or regional craft guys or right. paying the same retail they would for the 6.5% IPA. Gotcha. Um, one, one more question on this, uh, specifically with the lagers. I mean, it takes a little bit longer uh, to produce. Um, I guess how much of the decision to allocate uh, space and time to lagers is being driven by, um, I guess, the, the ability to better balance uh, your capacity needs? I mean, are you, is, is some of that driving it, or is it really just responding to consumer demand and trends? I mean, for us, we've always brewed beer we like to drink and hope we find other people that like to drink it. So that's what it's really coming down to for us. We don't have focus groups to say, oh, the session IPA category is really hot. Let's find a beer because we've got to fill that niche. It came down to having a balanced portfolio, which right. is something conscious that we look at um, of great beers. But it really became because that's something we wanted when we're going into our tap room to have beer. Well, I guess I guess my point was more so that we hear so much that um, you know brewers are butting up against capacity and they're adding tanks and they can't keep up with demand, and yet you know some of them are allocating all this space to loggers, and it's like a little bit um, counter for me. Uh, Screws to, everything up. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, how, how do you guys make those decisions? Because, you know, you got to respond to the demand. You want to, you know, kind of ride a little bit of the, the trend there. Um, but if it means you, you know, only turn a tank over in half the time, you know, you're losing sales on potentially, you know, some of your other core beers. Uh, yes, you're, you're right. And we had to make a conscious decision, you know, to do that. Um, and, and it's a tricky thing in that balance. So right now, Demand, uh, demand has totally outpaced supply of, of our lager. Um, and we can't just quickly overnight add more tanks to make more lager, even though it's selling, because fortunately for us, our other flagships are still selling. We're up right. with everything. So, you know, you know, the talk before us with Joey and Tim is how do you grow creatively? And one of the ways we're, we're growing is with the capacity that Brew Hub has added. And uh, we're ma you know, we'll be making a lot more lager over there. So hopefully we're not going backwards because of the tank time. Right. We, I can't go to Joey and say, hey, it's great. We got this brand. Uh, it's really on fire, but we're going to sell less beer than we did last year because we have this lager. That, <laughs> it's not going to work. So right. we've got a plan for that. Yeah, and, and I would say that it does present production difficulties. We've wanted to do a Pilsner since we opened, um, but we kept you know, getting pushed back when we would look at this, the schedule and try to figure out how to fit it in, because it ties up a tank for a while if you want to do it right. And so um, I guess it was just this year, really, like just before Christmas that we sat down and looked at next year's kind of plan and schedule and figured out, okay, we can fit it in in the summer once. And wow. we'll see, we'll just enjoy it. So that's what we're going to try to do. Nice. Um, and, and long term uh, for the Florida market, how do you guys see it continuing to mature, continuing to evolve um, as you kind of peer out into the future? I know nobody has a crystal ball or anything, but, uh, you know, where do you see things going over the next 12 to 18 months um, in general? I mean, how do you see this market developing? 
again, we're behind other states, which is good and bad. Um, it's good because we can just follow trends. I mean, we look at national numbers all the time to see the trends, to see what we should be focusing on, things like that. So I, I see a couple more years of people, uh, more discovery before people are going to come back to the true sessionable, the loggers and things like that. So, um, but again, you, you have only a fraction of the customers or the, the beer drinking age group, people drinking craft beer. So you have a lot more people that can actually just get introduced to your beers too. So... Uh, but we see a couple more years of maturing before you, you see sessionable beers really becoming a thing. And Justin, for you? Uh, we just look at Michigan and New York because they all retire down here. And uh, so that's how we figure <laughs> out what we're going to do. Um, no, I mean, in the next 12 to 18 months, I think we're going to see lots of great breweries open and continue to make quality beer. And we're all going to work together to educate. I, I don't see, I see everything as positive for sure in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, we're all working to, to take shelf space um, and keep it, you know, local when we can. And uh, I, I see the next 12 to 18 months, you know, being very positive. There's a lot of room for growth as we started the conversation uh, in the state of Florida, being that we're only a 10 share in dollars. We can all sell a hell of a lot more beer in our state if we work together to educate the consumers. And don't Kent. discount. <laughs> don't discount. We've heard that a number of times now. Kent, uh, your vision of the future over the next 12 to 18 months? What he said. <laughs> Mic drop. Um, so uh, just a couple of quick numbers, and then um, I guess we can go enjoy some more beers. Uh, but I, I found these pretty interesting. I guess over the last 52 weeks, total beer sales are up 5.5%, and over the last 13, they're up uh, seven point two percent, according to Nielsen. Uh, that's all stores, um, all channels. Uh, but craft, meanwhile, is about nine point six percent and twelve percent, respectively. So, um, craft definitely outpacing, you know, category-wide beer trends here in Florida. Um, and you know, I guess nationally, craft is a fifteen-plus share, uh, but up seven and a uh, little over seven and a half percent over the last thirteen weeks. So. Um, clearly something is working here. It could be a maturity thing, as you guys have pointed to. Uh, it could be something else, but um, you guys are doing something right, it seems, here in Florida. Something in the water down here, as uh, Shooter McGavin might say. <laughs> it's also, you know, our, our busy time of year. You know, people are, the snowbirds are here, um, so we have some more people right now that we're selling beer to, but I don't see a major dip after Easter when they tend to all leave. I think it's, we're still all going to be looking up, personally. All right. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining. Um, I don't want to keep us from enjoying some more beers uh, and networking. Thank you all for attending tonight. A round of applause for everybody tonight. Thanks to Chris for bringing your crew down here and hosting one of these in Florida. Thank you guys for coming to support something like this in Florida. We need more events where we're all getting together and talking about business. That's how we're going to grow to be California and to do these things. So it's really important that we all show up to events like this. So thank you guys for coming and thanks a lot, Chris, for finally thank you. listening to Joey and I pestering you to do one in Florida. You guys needed more breweries before we showed up. And I was promised Battle Pac-Man and, and you lied to me. We failed on that one. Yeah. Next time. Um, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention all of our uh, fine sponsors. Um, they're all listed up here. Uh, I, I won't go down the, the entire list, um, but they really make this possible. They allow us to travel around the country uh, with these lights and these banners and these cameras and uh, an entire crew, uh, Josh, our video guy up there, uh, Corey in the back doing registration, Jane somewhere taking notes and writing about this tomorrow. Um, the entire team puts this thing on. I just get up here and uh, hold a mic and uh, tell everyone to answer questions, and then uh, we all drink beers. So let's go do that. Cheers. Thank you, guys.